Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Lynn. I'm one of the managing partners of the Financial Executives Consulting Group. We're going to start the main body of our presentation in just a couple of minutes. We've got a large crowd uh, logging on, and I want to make sure everybody is uh, nice and settled in before we start. For those of you who have just signed in, uh, you are in mute-only mode, which means that you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. We have a formal presentation today, but if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and we'll take them in the order in which they're received. Uh, because of the large crowd, we may not be able to get all the questions answered online, but we will definitely take them offline uh, if we can't get them all in. Also, if there's questions that you don't want me to ask out loud uh, for various uh, purposes, uh, not a problem. You can send me an email. And again, we will take those offline. So uh, I'm going to go away for a moment, and we're going to come back in, and we're going to start here in about another minute or two. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Lynn. I'm one of the managing partners of the Financial Executives Consulting Group. I want to welcome everybody to our webinar today, Time for Companies to Rethink Their Banking Relationships. We're going to start the main body of our presentation in just a moment, a couple of administrative notices. Uh, you are in mute-only mode, which means that uh, you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Uh, during the formal part of the presentation, if you have questions, please type them into the question box on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, in the allotted time. But not to worry, if you've typed them in, we'll get to them offline, uh, so we can answer those questions in turn. If there's questions you don't want me to read out loud, uh, send them to me by email, and again, we'll take them offline. Uh, for those of you who are on the line and want CTP credits, uh, all attendees will get CTP credits, after completing the uh, survey, which will launch uh, after the survey is over. So this is uh, 1.1 uh, or 1.2 uh, CTP or CCM credits um, for this presentation. So with that, let's get started. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the uh, time for companies to rethink their banking relationships. And as all of you must know, uh, things today are not what they used to be. So with that, I want to introduce the speakers, uh, myself here. Uh, you can read this, but uh, I've been doing this for a few years. Certainly can remember back to the Great Recession years. And in my humble opinion, uh, we are somewhere between the Great Recession and the Great Depression. This is not like it was 10 years ago. Um, so it is uh, unknown territory. And my crystal ball is in the cleaners. So I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what's happening, but hopefully we can give you some pointers and then you can take it from there. And uh, again, uh, Beatrice, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Beatrice Saldivar. I'm Director of Treasury and Payments with ASO Tree Solutions. Um, just like Bruce, I've been around for over 20 years, uh, definitely working as a corporate treasurer with a lot of um, Fortune 500 companies helping set up uh, treasury centers, chair service centers, and running them. Also have been in the consulting side and the, now the technology side. Always embracing technology uh, that can make the daily treasury operations better for treasurers. As you know, I have uh, I have been there. So thank you for that, Bruce. Great. So let's just talk about the agenda for a moment. We're going to look at relationships really from two perspectives. It's always good to know uh, who's on the other side of the desk. 
and know what they want and know what you want so we can both come to a, a relationship and to a decision. Talk a little bit about um, priorities, uh, looking at price versus performance. This is a trade-off that uh, there is no right answer, but it's something you do have to consider. And then the idea of how you might want to manage what I think is sort of the hidden part of most relationships is really the fee side of relationships. And again, time for Q&A. So with that, uh, and as part of the CTP process, I really would like to know a little bit more about the audience. And uh, the way to do that is to ask some polling questions. And here is one that I am going to launch right now. And it really asks, uh, how many banks uh, does your company use on a global basis? So I'd appreciate it if everybody could vote. And then we will close the polls, and I will share the results uh, with those in the audience. I think everybody else would also like to know a little bit about today's relationships and the question, how many are there? Okay, we give uh, people some more time. Obviously, there is no right answer here because the number of banks you use depends on your business, depends on your organization, uh, depends on how complex it is. So I don't think there is any right answer here, but I think people are going to be a little surprised um, by the answers. I'll give you a hint. More is not necessarily better. Okay, uh, a couple more seconds. Three, two, one, and thank you very much. And let me just share the results here. Okay, um, we have, suffice to say, we've got over 200 people on the line here. So it gives you an idea of, of where uh, the answers, uh, what the answers could suggest in terms of relationships. Um, Interesting enough, I would have guessed that it would have been between six and 10 banks, but obviously that is not what the, the number is telling you. There, you know, roughly two thirds uh, of the people on the line are using anywhere between one and five banks. And you can see that there is also a good slug of people who are using uh, over 20 banks. So the answer here is do you need, you know, how many banks do you need? And I think the answer is really fewer than, than larger. Beatrice, what do, you, what do you think? Yes, I think, you know, a lot of treasures are adapting now. Uh, before there was, um, uh, there were a lot of treasures to mergers acquisitions of the companies that had uh, uh, basically a lot of relationships with banks. They start rationalizing and downsizing some of those relationships and just making sure that they took into account not only their core banks were they're extremely important, but other banks that make sense, including a lot of corporations that have multinational uh, uh, global businesses, they decided to even try to rationalize further that by centralizing uh, their treasury operations in bank accounts management with board resolutions. And I think this is the reason that we have seen a very strong shift from the last five to 10 years from having more banks to less banks with a 60% one to five. So definitely we, we do see that trend that they're rationalizing their relationships, automizing them and making them better. Well, let's look at the uh, relationships between corporates and their banks. I'm gonna start on the bank side for the moment. And uh, there's basically two parts to a relationship. One is the lending relationship and the other one is really an operating relationship. Now, I don't know if this is a surprise to anybody, but the lending relationship is actually not that profitable from a margin perspective. Uh, certainly, it is something that the corporates desire, uh, the That's idea of liquidity. Me, Bruce, um, have you switched from the poll to the presentation? My apologies. My mistake. Thank you very much. Yes. So, okay. Thank you. Let us move on to the right slide. Thank you for that. Um, little technical glitch. Uh, let's start from the bank's perspective here. And you can see the lending relationship is often where uh, the relationship starts. Um, the corporate obviously needs liquidity. They go to their banks, uh, they come up with an arrangement, and uh, you can see that the money is changes hands. What you don't see necessarily is that when a bank lends, it uses up scarce capital. 
And as a result, uh, it can generate certainly uh, profits. Uh, when you look at LIBOR plus 50, LIBOR plus 100, LIBOR plus 200, and you look at the kinds of loans, 10, 20, 100, 500 million dollars, surely that's a big number. But from a return standpoint, we're actually not so much. On a risk-adjusted return on capital, loans are actually a very large user of capital and in a sense can pull down a uh, bank's overall profitability, especially as you'll see in a moment when you get into a situation where a number of bankruptcies or, or, or the uh, hard times require uh, corporates to perhaps waive, ask for waivers, or even negotiate new loans. And the banks don't want to lose. I mean, if $100 million and you take at 2%, uh, all you got to do is lose half of that to lose 10, 15 years worth of profits on a loan. So there is credit risk out there. Now, the operating relationship, interesting enough, uh, may not be generate the large numbers that a loan could, but there's actually less risk or risk of a different type. Not only that, but companies that store their balances at their banks help those banks lower their own fund, the funding costs. Why? Because they don't have to go to the market and buy at whatever the market rates are. I mean, if you can tell your bank that you're going to keep $50 million in that bank for the next year, it doesn't have to worry about what the rates are over the next year in the markets because it knows it has a certain amount of funding. At the same time, um, banks make money by executing transactions. That's the moving part of, the, uh, of this business. Uh, you also build in connectivity to customers' operations. And I will tell you that having you know, been consulting for many corporations, once you've built those connections, you are loath to leave that bank. So this is great for the bank. So you have to realize that. When you're thinking about your relationships, you want a bank that can do what you need, but you also realize that the more lines you build into the bank in your back office, the harder and harder it is for you to leave. And so there's inertia there, which can be um, a factor uh, against your negotiating position, for example. And uh, operating services, uh, everything else being equal, are really a low user of capital. And yes, you have to invest in the latest cyber crime, fraud, whatever, but the amount of capital required once you do that is uh, it's a great return because you're not risking it all the time. You build it once uh, you, and sell it many, many times uh, at the same terms to many, many customers. So uh, the operating relationship is actually a very valuable part of any relationship. And again, this is from the bank's perspective. So what are their goals? Obviously to optimize revenue, but they also want to increase their return on assets and fees help do that. Uh, if you have, again, net interest income or expense to the bank and have operating relationships, you can increase that return to their assets, oh, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 percent. And of course, it helps optimize uh, their uh, risk-adjusted return because they're getting more in the numerator and they're not really risking any more in the denominator. Uh, let's take a look at today. And here, again, is the example I was talking about. There's going to be some tremendous credit risk for banks out there. This is a snapshot from Bloomberg for about a six week period. And you can see that there are a lot of banks, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of corporations that have had their name in the papers because they're pulling down cash under their revolvers. That's the blue part of this chart. And again, these are the more credit worthy. Uh, obviously, they have to be public companies. The interesting thing to me is the brown part where the banks are saying, you know, you guys want money, I get it, uh, you need liquidity, it's your business. Let's talk about new loans. It's a tacit admission that the old loans may not have been best for the banks. Because if they were, then the banks would just say, well, we'll give you some new loans at similar conditions, but they're not. The new loans are coming with more covenants, and these are anti-cash hoarding covenants, LIBOR floors, prepayment options, uh, so these are covenants that you might not have seen for mm, the last 10 years because the banks are realizing that there's going to be a storm coming. Now, let's put this in proportion. 
interest income versus non-interest income. This is from the FDIC. Uh, this is obviously a compendium of, of all banks, about 8,000 banks. But what you see here is the red line in which fees, going back to 2009, fairly consistent as a percentage of net operating revenues, about the 40, 38, 35 percent, very consistent uh, from an income perspective. And even from an expense perspective, you see that non-interest expense salaries fairly consistent within a band, but look at the loss provision, another type of expense. 2009, 40% of net operating revenues went down obviously to about 5% just recently. Where do you think it's gonna go in 2020? So all of a sudden, banks are gonna start losing a lot of money on their loans because that's the loss provision that they have to account for. And here's a good example of that. Uh, back in the old days, you look at, again, this is only like five or six banks. So the, the last one was literally 8,000 banks in total. And these are six banks, but these are the, these are some of the leaders. B of A, Citi, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo. Uh, this was as of about three weeks ago. They are announcing huge increases in their provisions for loan losses. So are those loans really going to be that part of the relationship they're going to emphasize going forward? If they're going to start making some money, I would argue not. But again, you have to look at your relationship. Um, so now let's switch over to the corporate side a little bit and talk about how corporations might want to look at those relationships. Obviously, in many banks, I mean, one to five banks or 11 to you know, 15 banks. So, you know, do you favor a bank? Uh, why? Price, performance? What are, you, what are you looking for here? And so you have to understand a little bit more about what your goals are more than just lending. Uh, again, as a treasury consultant, quite frankly, I do get paid to, to scuff the dirt on bankers' shoes. Uh, but I will tell you that banks have very good services. They are someone you want to do, want to have as a partner. But you have to consider what's good for you. They have to consider what's good for them. And during a crisis, what is it? Is it access to liquidity? Is it transaction execution? Well, I don't know. So let's go to the audience and um, find out. So we have another poll here, which I would like to launch. And I would ask you to uh, check. You can check multiple ones here. So, you know, what do you wrestle with when you decide what, what's good for you? Credit, non-credit, quality, uh, service price, share of a wallet. This last one is a little uh, a little uh, amorphous because what does that mean? You know, fair share, do you try to, if you have five banks, you try to give everybody 20% 20, 20 of your business. Um, what is fair? Uh, that's obviously up to you. So um, this is a good one because think about it if you had 20 banks. If you want to be fair, everybody gets 5%. What's that 5% worth to the bank? And are they going to pick up the phone for the 5% of the business that you give them? Uh, this is why you have to think about whether you want a lot of banks or not. Just because um, they're in a club deal or, or maybe they're direct lender. Again, there's no right answers here because I, I, it does depend a little bit on your business. But my point here is it, it is time to rethink these. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got people voting here. Yes, and, go ahead. Uh, Bruce, as they're voting, I also wanted to bring up that a lot of companies that they have multinational operations, a lot of the times this is like so critically important to choose the right banks. Why? Because there's a lot of them that have a global treasury centers, global or overseas, which means that they have to make sure that they partner with the bank that actually can provide them the services for those countries that they do business with. So that even becomes even more important for them when executing their daily treasury operations and looking for their main banks, especially their main in-house banks, because uh, treasurers, they handle the liquidity, everything you can think of for the whole company. So with that. Well, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, all right, here are the results. And um, a little surprising, actually, I, I think in the order of magnitude, 
Uh, quality of services uh, comes out to be the winner here, in which 73% of those voting have decided that really quality is what they're looking for. And um, I think that's I think that's the right answer uh, in, uh, empirically. Uh, the bad news is that how do you measure quality? Very difficult to do. Um, service price uh, number two, and I think that's primarily because it's easy to measure. But as we'll see in a moment, uh, price may not be the best way to approach uh, your bank relationship. Certainly, you want market rates. Um, and again, certain services, it's more difficult to figure out what those market rates are. Um, I am surprised a little bit that the you know the credit and non-credit services sort of came out roughly equal. Uh, I think that's interesting. Um, it shows that uh, there certainly is a need out there besides just you know, lend me more money. Beatrice, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think, you know, um, even more prevalent today, as we have seen with the COVID-19, uh, the banks have come out to shine to really be able to support the corporate treasurers out there and the services that they are able to provide with the technology for each bank at the back end that has been enabled is the one that has kept the treasuries right now afloat. Uh, so I, I really think that this is this services that they can offer is uh, one of the keys for um, them to be operational. All right, let's, uh, I'll take this down and let's go on with the other parts of the presentation. So again, this is another more idealistic view of your corporate perspective. With any corporation, you've got your banks uh, and your markets on the left-hand side, the company and all those people who use the banks sources and uses of funds, executing transactions, disbursements, receipts, sort of on the right-hand side. And treasury, uh, or the treasury function, is really in the middle. Uh, these are interrelated services um, in which you really have to have certain perspectives available if you're going to evaluate your relationships and understand whether they're actually working for you. Uh, and one of these, as you see on the right-hand side of the screen here, the whole idea of metrics and what you're using to demonstrate value. You know, what's the old saying? You know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You should know where you're going. Your relationship, you should know where you're going with your relationship. So you should have metrics and you should have some functions and systems that are integrated so you can figure out whether you're doing a good job or not. All right, let's just look at one element now of a relationship. And again, I'm staying on the operating side for the moment because we can't cover everything in an hour here. But when we talk about operating relationships, you're talking really about the whole idea of moving and storage, uh, keeping balances in your bank, uh, executing transactions, receipts, disbursements, and obviously being able to account for all of these uh, at some point in time. Each of the elements in this overall triangle are things to be concerned with. We obviously can't address all of them, but it's important that when you look at an element that certainly is important, uh, which are service prices, uh, as the uh, as the poll showed, that you want to evaluate price versus performance, and, and here I mean performance being quality. You want the right services at the right price for your company, and again, quality is difficult to measure. Uh, and price sometimes can be a proxy for that, but you really have to understand what kind of business you have, uh, which is to say identifying the, the unit of value. And then you need some targets. Whatever they are, you need targets. And then you want to compare or you want to benchmark uh, your performance uh, to those targets. And if you can find it, perhaps even your performance versus others of your competitors, there are certain people and services out there you can use that can help you say whether your prices are market or not. But again, there are a lot of other factors and we can't address them all. The idea of standard versus custom service, the idea of paying by earnings credit versus fee. Uh, I would argue that this is actually a hidden price, uh, a hidden service that most people don't see. The idea that sometimes you pay per transaction other times you pay per time period. Maintenance services on uh, is 
something like that. So with that, let me just turn this over to Beatrice and, and she can talk a little bit more about uh, managing a relationship. Yes, thank you, Bruce. So, you know, we all have to deal in the daily treasury operations. We have to deal with managing the bank relationships, there, the fees thereof. But at the end of the day, what's so important is, first of all, uh, the bottom line is how do you get your data? Are you getting uh, currently your data electronically through the monthly bank statements, different formats? And then if you are a multinational company, do you have the right formats to get? Uh, and then is there somebody internally in your company able to process this data for you? Or are you using a combination to be able to make sense out of it? A combination, a hybrid combination between S-Force and Excel and at the end of the day, what is it that you're seeing in your data? That's, so that's the most important thing, that your banks do have your data. And even though you might be getting monthly statements, it might take a lot of work for you to be able to digest that. But what's in the data is so important. So this, this is why it's, uh, it's even more critical today that, you know, getting away from the manual spreadsheets and actually trying to uh, put an automatic solution like a treasury management system or other third party becomes essential because they, you can get all the data combined and you are able to tell the story of where are your fees and we're going to see examples in a minute of where your fees could be going through, Where what is it that you're paying bank A versus bank B versus bank C. and you're going to be able to actually have a standard and a lot of the times we you know like if we're talking about the investments we think okay how do we benchmark this investments and their performance well it's the same strategy that we have to take a look at fees how do you benchmark them if you have one relationship what do you benchmark them with if you have multiple like in the a survey that we saw right now on the poll you know one to five relationships had the higher percentage well, what do you compare those five banks to in the industry? Could it be the Association of Financial Pro Professionals, an example, or something else? But you do have to have a standard to compare in order to for you to see how competitive your banks are, your current relationships, and especially those core banks that definitely uh, you, want, you want to keep that relationship. And then uh, there's also decisions internally that have to be made. Um, are you taking a lot of time using your data, getting your data, performing the analysis, maybe through a hybrid or maybe through a combination of just an Excel and using your uh, internal treasury resources? Because as we know, treasury centers are very slim and that's by design. However, at the end of the day, you want to be able to have it visible there, not only uh, for the month, but for the quarter for the year and be able to compare where we are now versus what we were in another time period and be able to make automatic decisions. So you have to be able to know whether, you know, you keep working the way it is, if you're doing it on a manual basis, if you build it, if you have the uh, resources in the house or at the end, um, you know, fees become a risk to you if you don't know your fees. So this is one of the things that a lot of corporate treasurers struggle with, especially when they go through mergers and acquisitions and they can acquire anywhere between 200, 300 bank accounts and they they try to optimize and rationalize and close accounts and open new accounts because of the different business models. But they always struggle with seeing what are the banks that they're actually paying and at the end, you know, what is the risk of doing nothing basically on that? Next slide, Bruce. Sure. Uh, let me give you. Uh, let me just get to this next slide. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So, with the bank statements that you saw earlier, every business is going to have a different business model. You're going to process different transactions. This here are just some of the types of transactions that can post in your uh, bank statement that you see from the traditional checks that people still use paper checks now with the COVID-19. I have seen a lot of corporates that were heavily using uh, checks. Now they're transitioning 
their operations to some type of electronic payment because they have seen or heard or read that. But you still see it in the statements, the ACH, reconciliation, monthly account fee, payment returns, the stock payments, uh, manual stops. So this here is, of course, a series, including wires. But why is this important? Because it could be that your, your uh, company might use just a few of this a month, but it could be that you could have from a couple of hundred to, you know, in the hundreds and, and moving on. But how do you manage this? And which of, of the items within the bank statements can create value, add value, or take value away from you? So right here is basically, how are you going to be able to seek value by knowing really what you're getting out of your bank fees? Uh, definitely the banks are there, we need them, but at the same time, you need to be very proactively managing your fees to make sure that it's something within your tolerance level is acceptable. And if you ever have an outlier to make sure and understand what happened here that we have an outlier in the in the bank fees, is said that the policy of the bank change or is said that maybe the benchmark that we're using is not the most adequate. Uh, you know, what is it that we need to do internally to make sure that we have guidelines, a policy, and compliance when it comes to uh, our bank fixed relationships? And at the end, how to seek the value of the fees? Bruce? Sure. Let me just go now to a, an example here so you can see a little bit about how this would work. Again, we're talking about the operating side of a relationship because if you're a bank, you want to optimize your risk-adjusted return on capital, which means you want as much in the numerator as possible and as little in the denominator as possible on a risk-adjusted basis. And operating services like these have a lot less risk, relatively speaking, than a credit would have, especially in today's environment. Now, this is a uh, company. Uh, they spend $57,000 a month, but you see this as a percentage basis here, lockbox services, information services, and so on and so forth. So uh, you have obviously some major services here uh, in terms of disbursements, which would make sense, uh, incoming or outgoing wires or ACHs, uh, and then information, so because you want to know 9 o'clock in the morning, where in the world's my cash? So you look at the percentage of these, and you go, well, that's nice. You know, how do I optimize that from my perspective so that I get what I need as a company and the bank, of course, earns a fair share on their investment in all these services? So the reason I put this up, because it's just sort of a night way of keeping track of these services. And I would argue that the way to look at these services is how the, the, what value they actually add in connecting that what I'll call that left side of that diagram the market with the right side of the diagram, which is your company, and trying to figure out where the value is. So again, these are the service families. Now, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of services out there that a corporation could use. Here they've been grouped into about nine or 10 different families. And here's the $57,000 again. Um, how to determine the value? Well, the hint here is, you need the key volume. Why, are I, why am I using this service? ACHs, incoming, outgoing, okay? I'm using 29,000 of them, 30,000 of them. I have four bank accounts. So I'm spending 6,500 bucks. I'm doing 30,000 transactions. Again, these are the key volumes, not total volumes. There's 25 other parts, nuts, bolts, washers, gaskets that go into this, but you buy these services because you want money coming in or you want money going out. Uh, 29,000 of them, 22 cents a piece. Now look what happens when you look at other services like ACHs, lockbox services, obviously money coming in, wire and other funds coming in or out. Uh, look at the difference in prices on an all-in basis. You have to determine whether there's value here. $9 for a wire, that's an average price. Uh, 2,800 bucks, you did 308 of them. Again, in out, I know there's different prices here, but my point is that if you want to negotiate with your bank, sure, they'll be glad to drop the price 
from $9.12 to $8.50, 10% drop. That pales by insignificance in terms of what it costs for ACHs. So you have to think of what the real value here and not just look at price. And how that would work is depends on how your systems are oriented. Can you integrate automatically with some of these services? That's worth something also. So again, you just can't look at a price. You have to look at and this. I think this is why people sort of vote with quality of service. And it's very difficult to do unless you've got some good metrics involved here. And even you can see lockbox services, certainly a cheaper way of receiving funds and an incoming wire. But again, order of magnitude more than an ACH. Uh, same thing with paper disbursements. Uh, you can look at the two services here. One is uh, reconciliation, the other one is disbursement, which is to say um, paying a check and reconciling the check. But together it's like 75 cents. Again, much more expensive than an ACH by a factor of three. So why would you want to issue paper? And I'm not even talking about fraud here. Um, it's easier to defraud somebody with, with paper than it is with electronic, although people are getting very sophisticated. So my point here is that you look at these services, you look at them by family, pick the key volume, look at your prices, compare them bank A to bank B to bank C, uh, and find out where the real value is in your relationship. Because the banks want those fees, especially this time around. Um, so, Bruce, if, if I can make a comment right quick, if you can go back to that sure. one. Um, I think we have an opportunity here as in the corporate treasury roles to not only look at what uh, Bruce just mentioned, but also look for example here, we take lock, lock services, which takes a big chunk, you know, total cost 12,439 had the higher percentage. Look at your business model and say, why is it that we're paying so much for uh, lockbox services? Is it because this was or is the way it has always been done? Is it because uh, we haven't been able to convince the treasurer, the CFO, or the higher executives to buy in on automizing something that uh, changing into other type of transaction methods? Um, it could be a lot that, for example, a lot of companies that are still using uh, a lot of checks um, and it's costing them, it could be just as simple as going deep in there and analyzing your business model to see if what you were doing in the last five years, 10 years, 15, 20, it makes sense, does it make sense now? Can te technology enable you to actually take a deeper look and maybe automize something and change it from a paper check perhaps to uh, something electronic transaction? And, um, you know, look at the cost versus benefit analysis per unit and as a whole, uh, look at the transaction history of what you're processing with your company to see if it makes sense. Uh, so this is another thing that a lot of, uh, you know, treasury centers, I know that uh, resources are always very scarce, but they, uh, they need to take a deep look at what is it overall over a time period what line items are really, really taking most of your resources there. Thank you, Bruce. No, that's a very good point because the bank service fees you see here are really only the tip of the iceberg. Think about all the people on the other side, uh, which is to say inside the company, who are reconciling transactions, who are executing transactions, and something I forgot to mention the first time around, looking to see what's going on. In the middle, you see information services, uh, call it $11,000 a month here. Um, yes, you're using 51,000, I'll call it access units. Uh, it's a very uh, sort of uh, unusual measurement there. But you have to ask yourself, I'm spending $11,000 a month and I have a treasury management system. That costs me money too. Wait a minute, I'm getting the same information twice I'm paying the bank $11,000 a month, and I'm paying my TMS vendor by seed or by month, whatever, uh, for the same information. So I'm duplicating services here. Uh, maybe I don't need as much information services from my bank uh, because they're being sent to me in a form that is just expensive. And I've got the same information 
basically at a, at a, at a fixed rate through my TMS vendor, for example. Um, and again, you have to look at um, what it costs you to run your network. So you could cut through all of these transactional volumes and just look at it by account, $57,000 a month. I've got basically, looks like four accounts here, could be a little bit more. So you know, what is that costing me here on a monthly basis for every bank account that, that I have? So again, the right way to look at it, I, I can't really tell you exactly, but you have to look at the key volume. You just can't look at the fact that I spent $6,000 and I want to make that smaller for ACH maintenance. Because no bank is going to play, well, how low can I go? Oh, sure, let me lower my prices to you, please. They have to make money. You want services. What's the value trade-off here? And again, when you look under, especially under the current situations we have, you really have to think about priorities here. Uh, again, it goes back to a little bit about uh, share of wallet, in which probably not a good strategy to offer everybody the same because banks are going to be looking at who my best customers are. And in my humble opinion, uh, some customers are going to get kicked out of the lifeboat. Uh, they're going to have to fend for themselves. So you want to be valuable to your bank, and the bank wants you to be valuable to them. Obviously, you have to have that to have a relationship. So there has to be some priorities here. And I would just argue that the operating service side of the relationship is one way in which everybody can come out ahead. That's the good news. The bad news is there's so many services out there. What are all these things? Uh, on a multinational basis, there's over 800. On a U.S. basis, through the AFP, uh, there's over 2,500. So how do you really look at these things? And so that is something that um, uh, every company is going to have to mm -hmm. think of. And, and here's one way to do it. And I'll turn this one over to Beatrice. Yeah, and actually, if you go back to the previous slide, I wanted to make a comment on the benchmark. We talked earlier about benchmarking, the importance to make sure that even if you feel comfortable with a source that you're benchmarking to, that always analyze it. But one of the key things when you are looking at bank fees is whether you have one to five relationships, whether you have 20 banks, it's always analyze them by account, by bank, first by bank, bank A, bank B to C, what I mentioned earlier, by account, because that's so important, because each account is going to be separate. There's some accounts that have a lot of heavy activity. There could be your daily operating account, your payroll account. Um, maybe you're a multinational company that has a lot of different entities that uh, have accounts, and then there's maybe some country requirements that you have to have a special account, especially um, for doing business in those countries to pay taxes for maybe capital injections. But always look by account, because by account is going to show you, even by country and by entity, if you just have domestic entities, where it makes sense to have a bank account versus not. And then look at uh, by line item. Line item is going to show up those earlier examples of what comes in through your bank statements transactions, and it's going to be able to really show you where your money is going, where your fees are. But you definitely have to have that perspective to use the benchmark by bank, by account, by line item to be able to be successful knowing how to leverage your bank fees, because at the end, your bank fees, they're going to become to you a negotiating, a leverage power with knowing exactly where you are, what you're paying, and knowing uh, with your core banks and non-core banks what you're able to negotiate. And with that, on the next slide, I'm going to just show you this example. Uh, this one here is just an example of how you can actually automate your bank fees. For example, you can automate them by service. That way, automatically, the debt is at the back end. You can pull all kinds of graphs and see what is it that I'm paying by service earlier. You know, one of the examples we brought in was the lockbox services. Bruce also touched a lot on the ACH and uh, paper disbursement services. So you can bring that in. You can also look at it by the high bank accounts, the bank accounts that have the highest fees, and why? Is it because it's an operating and it's not? Or maybe it's an account that has 
a couple of transactions, but maybe had high fees and you have no clue that that was happening. Also, depending on the business model of your company, you can look at them by country, by country that you're doing or by entity, if you are just domestic or by country and entity to see where the majority of your fees are going. Also, in this example, we only have a bank fees by currency in the USD, uh, but you can also put in, if you're doing GVP, Euros, you're doing Japanese Gen, or one-day currency, same-day currencies, uh, two-day currencies, you can actually be able to see what is it that you're paying if you didn't negotiate paying your bank fees in USD and you negotiate them in the local currency. Also, as I mentioned to you, important is the core relationships with your bank are extremely important, but also more important is what is it that you are paying to your bank? Right here in this example, we're not favoring any banks. We're just taking two banks here, Bank of America and Wells Fargo as an example. So <laughs> we're just saying a little bit of, okay, you're paying Bank of America this and Wells Fargo this. Again, this is only an example. And then also, one of the things that we have here is that we have bank fees by company. This is what I referred to also earlier in reference to entities. So a lot of the times, uh, maybe your business model, you could also be in, in the retail business, or maybe your business model as a whole, maybe you have uh, 15, 20 bank accounts, maybe you have 100 by company entity that is important for you to be able to see the value of those bank accounts per entity. So this is an example of how you can automate your bank account uh, relationship your fee analysis, again, you would be able to use this data at a glance. You'll be able to actually drill in and be able to look at what uh, Bruce mentioned, instead of having the duplication from the bank information, you'll be able to automate it and see it and, and be able to make more important decisions. And more than anything, as I mentioned earlier, you'll be able to leverage this when you meet with your bankers and be able to discuss what is working, what is not working for you, what they can do uh, for you, and, and maybe negotiate some key items that in the past, uh, this is the way they were done, but they have never been looked at at a deeper level. Thank you, Bruce. Thank Next? you, no, that's, that's very good. One, one item I forgot to mention here, I just want to go back one slide, or two slides. Um, look at what it says balance and compensation about $4,000 a month. That is, uh, interesting enough, a, a, a hidden fee that really has to do with cost of funds. What the bank is doing here is it's charging you a fee based on their need to comply with various Basel uh, liquidity ratios. Um, the ledger balances in this account and this customer at this time period was about $32 million. And on that $32 million, they were charged what amounts to 13 basis points. And so when you think about your earnings credit rate, and let's say you get an earnings credit rate that helps pay for some of these services, and the earnings credit rate is, I don't know, pick a number, 50 basis points, 35 basis points, 25 basis points. The fact of the matter is, is that if it's 25 basis points, half of that is already gone because by keeping $32 million in the bank, you're paying them $4,000 or 13 basis points. So you're actually paying uh, an expensive rate here if, if you think there's better use for that $32 million. Can you get more than 25 basis points by using that cash in your business, by investing in some sort of long-term uh, investment? Uh, these, again, decisions you have to make when you think about how your company or how your bank uh, views your perspective. I'm not saying that 12 basis points is too high and too low, except you have to think about how this actually subtracts from the value of those balances. And again, $32 million at 50 basis points on a monthly basis, it's worth about $13,000, $14,000. So um, you owe them $57,000. So there's a lot of fees going out the door here. Uh, even over and above what the value of your balances are. And again, it depends on your earnings credit rate. But whatever it is, you're losing a lot of it through the balance and compensation uh, service. It's like paying for somebody else's insurance, really. 
Okay, we're going to come to the final polling question, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. So let me launch this poll here. And again, this is a choose all that apply. So everything we've said, given your situation, looking out over the next 12 months, looking at your crystal ball, you know, how are you going to rethink your partner relationships over the next 12 months? Um, maybe you're not. But is it really credit, non-credit? Uh, are you really that concerned about prices? And then the whole idea of wallet share or return. Um, and it's always, uh, and Bruce, I think ways. on this one too, it's, um, it's also important that with the current crisis of the COVID-19, I think this also has shifted the focus of th the true relationships with the bankers, uh, you know, that have been there and assist in the corporates, uh, you know, to maintain liquidity and with any in capital funding injections that they need. So, uh, yeah, so this becomes even more prevalent today in today's environment. Okay. Well, that's true. All right, I'll give people a few more seconds here. And let me close off the poll. And three, two, one. Thank you very much. And let me just share the poll here with you. Oh, there we go. Okay. So let's see, what do we have here? Well, let's see, it's interesting. Um, sort of evenly divided. That's just sort of surprising here. Obviously, the you know, mathematically, you know, people are looking at it from a relationship standpoint. And when you consider relationship, um, the credit and non-credit, a few more people are worried about credit than they are non-credit, which is understandable. Um, and then there's a good slug of people who really aren't planning on changing their relationships at all, which uh, I got to be honest is perfectly understandable. Uh, if you have a good relationship, you know why upset that? I only hope that over the last hour or so that Beatrice and I have maybe given you some ideas that uh, if you're not changing your partner, at least you're going to go back to them and talk about how both of you can get through the next 12 months without killing each other. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so I think this is uh, this is interesting. Um, I would have thought more people would have been changing, but that's okay. Uh, Beatrice, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm even thinking. I mean, a little bit, uh, kind of like deeper. But although you know, we all sometimes feel a pain. Maybe one bank is performing better than another. I know when I did live treasury operations. One of the issues that we had in changing the relationships is that the banks are very embedded in our services that we do. Uh, not only our main in-house bank accounts, main treasury accounts, uh, the entities, uh, domestic global, but also, you know, between the ERP systems and the any other vendor systems. And then the main thing is, of course, our clients. So. A lot of the times when thinking of really changing a relationship is so important to analyze, you know, the whys and uh, to, to, you know, to see, you know, what all the moving parts and interdependencies that it would take to make that happen. Because there is a wish, but there's a lot of involvement, but definitely as long as you can create the value and, and the resources are there, uh, it's, it's a win-win. It can become a win-win. Thank you. No, that's true. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. I think we're this is the we're over the formal presentation here. So uh, now can comes. You switch, can you switch it to the presentation, Bruce? Say again. Uh, it, we're still in the poll mode. Can you switch it to the presentation? My apologies here. I forget. That. Okay. Click the right button here. There we go. So now what I'm going to do here is we're going to get to the question and answer part here. And I'm going to leave this slide up here so that people can see and contact us if they'd like to send us an email, questions that they might want me to ask offline or uh, send me questions offline or send Beatrice questions offline. But we do have a few questions here. And uh, let me start with this one. Uh, how important is being correctly scaled for your bank? 
better being a large fish in a smaller pool? That's a good question. Um, I, th I the, the, the basic answer is yes. I think you want to be a large fish in a smaller pool unless the pool doesn't allow you to do what you need to do. In other words, uh, you're working with the largest regional bank in your area, but you're starting to need more international services. Uh, there are only three or four what I would consider to be international banks, and they obviously are very large. The usual suspects, Citi, J.P. Morgan, B of A. Now, even the largest companies are smaller fish in that larger pool. So um, the initial, the answer is yes, better to be a large fish in a small pool, but also better to have the services that you need, which may require you to go to a, a bigger pool. Beatrice, any thoughts? Yes, no, I, I totally, I could not agree with you more on that. Um, this is like having a fine balance between what makes sense. Again, we go back to your business model, right? Because all these relationships are going to depend on where your company is, what stage it is, uh, uh, and what leveraging power do you have with your bankers? That's going to become also very important. All right, let's see. We have, a, we have another question here. Um, I have heard that major national banks are contracting or eliminating available working lines of credit for stable small companies. Um, I got to be honest, um, I would worry a little bit. Um, but again, credit, yes. But it, you don't have to be that large to have huge amounts of operating services. If you are a fee based, if you have a fee-based relationship with your bank and your credit is small, they might eliminate that, but maybe not. Because if they do that, then you're going to be taking your business elsewhere. They're going to be losing fees. Very tricky to answer. I think it certainly does decide, it does revolve around the quality of your company. If you're going to be breaking covenants, or if you can't meet covenants, or if you're going to be asking for waivers, or if you're looking for some very specific renegotiations, on your lines because of whatever. The bank is going to have to think about, I don't know if I have the time for that. I, I, we did a, uh, there was a webinar I was on last week with a banker, a lender, and a lawyer talking about the upcoming tsunami of, of uh, waivers that the banks may have a hard time servicing. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult, basically, but yes, I, probably a little worrying would not help would not hurt yeah and and if i can add to that i think in the present situation that we all find ourselves in with the COVID 19 we have seen a little bit of more banks being a little bit more uh strict in reference to how they approach every case i think a lot of banks are more open also to work with you rather than to close the doors uh but on the other flip end we have seen how this impact of the COVID-19 has really impacted a lot of corporations. A recent one, one of many, um, the Dallas-based Neiman Marcus, which uh, last week declared bankruptcy. Um, again, it's a retail-based business, and so it's kind of hard to sustain with the uh, with the retail stores being closed. So, with that said, everything kind of depends on the business models. But I think that the banks are rethinking also the covenants. Um, and, and aligning into how they can actually partner with you because the COVID-19 is something that it was unforeseen that none of us saw coming. So I have uh, my conversations with a lot of bankers. I have seen that they're more aligned with you, with your needs, rather than uh, let me just totally uh, not advance any anything in your credit lines. So I think that's a comfort zone right there. Okay, uh, let's see, there's a, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, what are three key aspects important for treasurers and CFOs to keep a banking relationship? I'm not sure I can go into too much detail there because a lot of it does depend. But I think uh, what I would say is take your covenants on your credit facilities seriously. No bad news. Um, if you think you're not going to make your covenants this quarter, don't wait until the 89th day of the quarter to tell them that. Uh, secondly is take a look at 
where you think you're going to be in the future uh, from a uh, operating perspective as well as a credit perspective. And then the last one really is sort of a communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, you want to have a relationship, an ongoing relationship, and not just when there's bad news or when the bank screwed up. Uh, that is not going to be the, 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 the best ideas today. Yes, and adding to, that, adding to that, Bruce, is basically creating that trustworthy relationship that's a two-way. That's extremely important because the bankers, as I mentioned earlier, that I have been in contact with, they're being extremely responsive into trying to help. doesn't matter if your corporation is small, medium, or large, or Fortune 500 or 100. They, they have been very responsive and have been there for you. So... Uh, I think the trustworthy part uh, is, is especially now, is very prevalent. That's true. Uh, well, we've reached just a, a moment. Well, we've reached the magic sort of one hour uh, mark, so I can understand where people have to disappear. And uh, thank you, you know, for attending for the moment. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes. So if for those of you who want to stay on, uh, we're going to run about another five or ten minutes or so. And then I think in fairness, uh, we, we need to leave. So if you do have to leave, uh, you will get a webinar recording so you can listen to some of the things you might have missed. So let's, here's another question here. Um, are corporations getting rid of banking relationships in today's markets? Uh, it's, again, a, a tough question. I'm going to say to some extent, yes, especially those that are overbanked. And again, it gets back to the idea of, of, of share of wallet. I think there's just a realization that if you can't give your bank a sufficient amount of business, they have to evaluate you, you have to evaluate them. And I've got to be honest, there are many similarities amongst banking services. Uh, so if you have customized services, uh, the answer is maybe not. You'd want to keep what you have. But if you have standardized services, then yes, you might want to shrink that. But I, I, I can't tell because it depends on the, what I'll call the credit versus non-credit side of the relationship. So certainly if you have a direct lender, uh, maybe not. But if you have a uh, club deal or if you're in a syndicate, uh, you might want to talk to your lead and think about uh, why you have, want that many banks. Certainly tougher to renegotiate covenants when you've got 20 banks in the syndicate than if you only had five. So um, I don't know if that is exactly the answer you're looking for. Um, it, it's almost like a hit depends, and um, I, I can't get any more specific than that. Beatrice, what do you think? Yeah, no, and I, I think it kind of depends. Again, I go back to the importance of not only having those trustworthy relationships, but the business model. I have seen a lot of corporates that they keep on rationalizing their banks and their bank accounts, and they keep uh, actually making it more, they, they want to make sure that it makes sense for the business, but where they do not need to have uh, banks, that they don't have any more banks than, the, than it requires for their operations and for their businesses. Um, I have seen a lot of corporations uh, definitely uh, rationalize and go from three, four hundred bank accounts to maybe a hundred and something, and uh, definitely is working for them. So I think everything is dependable on the business model. But yes, I have seen that uh, rationalizing it and having uh, a bit less instead of more, going back to the first poll question from one to five, has become uh, something that many of the corporates are moving to. Okay, here's another question. Uh, how are the various banks' uh, return on capital model changing in light of the recession, and how should companies now consider the wallet share? Uh, well, first of all, the answer is yes, they are changing their models. Uh, they're taking a sort of a much tougher look on what I'll call it collectability, uh, for lack of a better term. And uh, that's why my comment earlier here about really taking your covenants seriously Certainly, if you're asking for a lot of waivers or if you're not communicating or for one of those last minute, uh, oh, my God, I forgot about that. Sorry about that kind of a thing. 
uh, that goes into the model um, as a as a qualitative factor, um, and that will have an influence on on how you rank in in uh, in the banking models. Uh, as far as specific factors, I mean, I can't comment on that. Every bank does have a slightly different model, but banks are realizing that their profitability is going to uh, take a hit. I mean, you can read in the newspaper over the last weeks or two about putting billions of dollars into their loan loss provisions. Now the question is, you know, which customers are they going to be kicking out of the lifeboat? And I would argue that the ones with fees or big fee generators are going to be the last to go. So uh, that's just an opinion, and uh, I guess we could debate that one later. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, we've got a few more seconds or a few more minutes here, and then I think we're just going to have to cut off, but luckily we have all the questions typed in, so we will not lose any. Um, okay, a question here about, um, can you speak to what a $10 million revenue nonprofit might be looking at for improvements? Mm, that is a tough question. Um, again, I would go back to the idea that, that fee services would be what a bank was looking for. So I don't know what opportunities you'd have there. Don't know enough about you know, the nonprofit. Um, the other thought is, as, as, as with the other question, uh, whether you need liquidity or whether you need to actually switch banks to perhaps a smaller bank at fish to pond ratio uh, might be something that you might want to consider. Beatrice, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm thinking that a lot of banks are inclined to definitely, especially align in a different way with nonprofits versus not, uh, that they are able to actually look at the historical, for example, bank fees of a nonprofit, look what has happened over time. And even there, I think they're very inclined to work with them. Uh, there's a nonprofit in, in Houston that I talked to uh, last year. And one of the things that I got from them is their relationship that they have with their bankers. So um, a lot of the times it's just going there, even if you have to do it account by account, line item by line item, and see what you can negotiate with them because uh, they do, the banks, they want to keep a great relationship, but definitely they want to also nurture those nonprofits that become essential to them. So um, everything for the nonprofits has to be the historical and actually sitting down with the bankers and saying, how can you help us here? This is where we're spending the highest of our bank fees in this line items. Um, how can you help us? We're a nonprofit. How can uh, we negotiate it to make it a win-win for the bank and a win-win for the nonprofit? And, the, and they're able to do that. Okay, thank you. I think we got one last question here and then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna disappear into the night or the daytime. Uh, where can I find examples of service metrics that might apply to a corporate environment and how to compare to other banks. Uh, Beatrice, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, on this one right here, uh, the Association of Financial Professionals, the AFP, has a lot of great resources. Uh, they have done even a lot of different polls from the past and they have a, a lot of samples of metrics. I will see myself if, if I can get some from them and then, um, and then definitely, uh, if if uh, the person that asked the question is still on the webinar, they can reach out to me. And if not, when they listen to this webinar, they can reach out to me and I can get them some of this information. Well, that'd be great. Okay, um, thank you very much for everyone who's attended. And again, I'd like to end the webinar here. Any thoughts or comments, you certainly can address them to myself or Beatrice uh, at the email addresses below. And with that, I will end the webinar. And Beatrice, thank you very much um, for everything. And uh, hopefully we will talk some more about this subject. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks.